We're going to talk about inflation. We're going to talk about banking crisis 2.0. We're going to talk about perhaps a bailout financial engineers. And yes, we will even ask the great Anna Kelly what her greatest real estate fear is. How are you doing, Anna? I'm doing great. Always good to be here with you. Oh, absolutely. The The audience loves our long form content, so we will continue to give them what they want. Uh, I suspect we should start with inflation. It is Wednesday. We got the hot CPI reading yesterday. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to kind of look under the covers, but uh, what was your first kind of blush when you looked when you you heard about the the uh, CPI numbers? I did. You know, my first blush is it's not completely surprising. You know, I think that inflation is going to be harder to tackle all the way down to the 2% than it was to get it kind of down to where we are. And so we've been saying for some time, some some part of, of inflation is going to be sticky. I didn't get a chance to dive real deep into the numbers, but I did listen to a very quick um, blip with Charles Payne and Daniel Martino Booth the other day, right after it came out. And she said, essentially, most of that CPI is in housing equivalent, so rent equivalent, which we know is going to be sticky for a while as well because of our increases in taxes and insurance um, and the fact that we we no longer have to keep rents super low. We can increase them to you know accommodate some of those increase in our costs because the price to, to buy a home is so high right now. And so um, you know, I think that that piece, that housing component piece, stays a little sticky from what Danielle said, and I don't don't doubt her expertise and what she dug in was most of the rest of the numbers are actually really down. It was in housing component. And the one other piece is food. You know, food continues to remain expensive, but services like hotels and people eating out, that inflation's actually coming down. So it's more kind of of the same where I think the gut reaction, you know, the gut reaction of the markets was freak out because- right. Bad news for the economy is good news for the markets, and good news for the economy is bad news for the markets, right? right. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we can delve into why that is a little bit in some of the financial engineering that you you mentioned and what the markets are relying upon. But I think that we have to be real careful to have that knee-jerk reaction like we saw in the markets that, oh my goodness, the sky is falling because inflation went up, I don't know, 0.12 more than what estimates were. Um, it's a very small data point in the midst of a lot of other data points that show the economy is actually quite uh, softening quite substantially, as we talked about on our video last week. Yeah, I think there's a lot. I And I, I watched several videos with Danielle uh, yesterday as well. I think there's a couple of things to kind of rounding out because I did do a lot of reading about the numbers. So first off, you're right. 60% of the headline number can be tracked back to shelter, owner's equivalent rent. Right. Uh, if you if you do CPI X housing, it was like one point five percent, something like that, which is below so, the two percent target. Right. So yeah. it shows that these rate hikes are actually taking effect into a lot of the economy. Yeah. And then Danielle went one step further. She didn't do this in the interviews, but she I follow her on Twitter. Uh, I follow her on Twitter because she just she's really in the data. So she yes. actually put out a chart yesterday. I think it was the Atlanta Fed talking about rents. Now, one of the wrinkles we have to acknowledge is this is multifamily. It's not single family. But nonetheless, it showed that uh, lease ups, when you do actually current uh, rent versus the very lagging indicator in CPI is actually negative. I think it was negative 5%. So here's a, here's a riddle for you. Negative 5% is not disinflation. That is deflation. If you take what was reported in CPI of 6%, which was the yearly number, and you just take the 5% as the other number, negative, you could actually have 0% inflation, right? If, if shelter is 33% of the number. So if you replace yeah. a positive 6 with a negative 5, you, you get really close to 0. I mean, I thought that was weird. Yeah, you know, I I'd have to look at that chart to, you know, to see the the underlying data and what they're coming up with. I I think it's really difficult still 
to look at national numbers um, and occupancy, because again, kind of like we talked about real briefly in our video last week, where we talk about how very local and regional, not only is real estate, but also, you know, general economies, you know, there are certain cities that are just doing much better than other cities. Um, cities like Dallas have huge, much higher GDP per capita than the nation does. Mm. At the same time, though, however, parts of Dallas are very oversupplied for multifamily. And so so the supply and the demand, basically lots and lots of people, I'm just going to use that city because it's one I know about, I invest in, we're developing in, right? So I look at the data really closely. You have a lot of younger people still moving to the Dallas-Fort Worth metroplex, that general region. A lot of new jobs are coming in that area. But so many people started moving that they started really ramping up um, construction of new apartment complexes to kind of get ahead of that demand. And what we've seen is some of that demand and that moving has flattened out a little bit as work from home is starting to not be, you know, as popular with companies. But just as the new supply has come online, it's making it really hard to compete with the same number of people looking for housing, even if there's an increase, if they're all kind of concentrated in one area of a major metro you start to see that occupancy rates start to come down and they have to give either rent cuts or rent concessions. Now, I can tell you if it's an older building, they try to do rent concessions without showing that they're dropping rents because they want to be able to sell those properties and keep the NOI and the, the mm -hmm. rental income high. Um, so they'll just give one-time concessions as write-offs rather than reducing their rents. And so I think some of that is kind of hidden when you look at these national numbers and they're skewed by all the rapid oversupply in certain markets that makes it look like the whole economy might be down 5% in occupancy or rents. The reality is a lot of markets, especially suburban markets, they're undersupplied and rents are still keeping up. So I, I say all that to say, Michael, I don't think it's as easy or as simplistic to say, you know, housing was up six, let's take off five, and it's really only one. I think that that's too, I think it muddies a lot of the data. And I think, quite frankly, a lot of the data is really muddy because of the fact, uh, you know, of, of, of multifamily having distress and not wanting to report a decreased net income in addition to increased expenses and, you know, cap rates that have really, really risen. So I yeah. tend to think that that shelter is going to stay more sticky than probably what Danielle's charts showed, just based upon, you know, me having multifamily yeah. properties in multiple states and being really close to that data. I could be wrong, um, but I don't think that incomes and, and rent costs are really going to come down much more nationwide, if anything, if rates stay somewhat higher, um, those costs are going to come back up, in my opinion. Yeah, I think I think the key for me when I look at all of this data is I, I I'll say it this way: there's no chance that rents are really going up six percent right now. Uh, that the, the data, the way the calc, the way the Fed calculates owners' equivalent rent is so backwards looking. As yes, it it always misses the swings on both sides, right? Yes, true. As I'm as it I'm beating it up to the, yeah, it lags now. Is it is it negative five percent? Well, first off, the data wasn't complete because it was it wasn't housing; it was only apartments. It probably was only right. Class A apartments. Who knows? But so if the answer is not negative five and the answer is not positive six, the numbers somewhere in that range, I think, is fair. Which actually sure. means, given 33% of CPI, that this reading yesterday is really not that, it's not as bad as it looks, I guess. And then right. more importantly, today, we have a, a tool that all of us can go look at called Trueflation. Yes. Trueflation, uh, been around for a couple of years, been remarkably accurate the last nine to 10 months, remarkably accurate. It's showing, it, it, it updates daily. Inflation's at 1.37 percent. Wow, that and it doesn't surprise me. Too. That's below. Yeah, two. It, it it really doesn't surprise me because you know a lot, a lot of the data that we went and went over last week, and I I 
really encourage any of you listening to this that haven't listened to that, you go and listen to my interview with Michael last week. When you look at the vast majority of the economic data and all the leading indicators, they are showing us on a deflationary path. You know, inflation generally is starting to unwind. The economy is softening. Profits and earnings are down. Layoffs are increasing. Um, credit card debt's going up. You know, there's a lot more strain on the consumer. And so I think that that starts to really help the Fed bring inflation down without having to do much more, you know, with rates. So it doesn't surprise me that inflation is coming back down. And it's one of the reasons I think we're we're due for more of a harder landing than what mm -hmm. some people are saying or, or a recession. Um, and I think that, you know, these CPI numbers, again, when it's one number, um, the Fed are not dummies, despite what we might, you know, whether we agree <laughs> or disagree with with their, you know, their yeah. decisions. They do understand the data. They they do look at the data and dissect it. And, you know, they've said that we aren't talking about, you know, rate cuts in March. We want to see meaningful, consistent improvements. One data point isn't going to totally change what they decide to do. They're going to have to look at all the data, you know, as a whole. And generally speaking, the data is on the right path downward, mm -hmm. um, you know, in in most areas, including wages and and services inflation. So I saw something that Marriott came out with, you know, a, yeah. a decrease in, you know, expectations for profits as people start to travel less and, mm -hmm. you know, those types of things. So I, I'm not real worried that this one CPI report is going to suddenly make the Fed raise rates again. I, I don't think no. that. Again, no. I do think longer term, we could be due for a rebound in inflation uh, mm. with lots of, you know, external factors that that could lean that way for, for the long term over the next couple of years. But I think currently we're still on a path that is softening. Inflation is going to continue to come down um, I, I think rents are going to stay positive, you know, for most of the nation. I don't think they're going to go negative. Um, but but that's just kind of my my yeah. projection. I didn't I didn't change anything I'm doing, Michael, based upon that CPI reading. It's kind of like I'm still expecting that sometime in the summer, the Fed mm -hmm. starts to see all the softening in the economy and they do what they normally do. They go, OK, we're probably in a recession. We better cut rates. And then yeah. they do and they do so quite quickly and quite drastically. So I, I still expect that that's probably, you know, my base case that 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 happens, yeah. you know, maybe second part of the year. I like it. Well, let's switch gears to banking crisis 2.0. I think in the last 14 days or so, we have heard uh, about banks taking significant losses, right? Uh, I think it was New York Community Bank. There was a bank in Japan, bank in Germany, all highlighting uh, commercial assets that are being re marked to market, to use a, a, you know, yes. a term. And that is causing a liquidity problem and they're having to raise capital and just, just a lot of stuff. It's, yes. It, and the other thing I found out uh, this week while reading is we have about about a trillion, I think it's nine hundred and seventy three billion dollars of commercial loans uh, ref that are up this year. About yes. a third of that was extend and pretend from last year, right? They just kicked the can down a road a year, so that's that's what caused the nearly trillion dollars. Uh, how you know on a scale of zero to 10, 10 being the great financial crisis where we saw Lehman and all these others go bust. You have a feeling for how bad this might get on the scale of, you know, zero to 10? Yeah. You know, I don't think we're anywhere near the level of pain that is coming in commercial real estate values, lack of ability to refinance and um, the, the fallout then, you know, when, when loans cannot be refinanced and they default, that hits the bank's assets. And so the, you know, the the loan to me is the asset to the bank. If I default, you know, it it wipes out my liabilities. And, you know, especially if they're non-recourse, which by the way, a lot of commercial loans are non-recourse, right? But it's an asset to the bank. So if they suddenly have assets that are worth worth less and they have to devalue those assets and write them down, if their liabilities are greater than those significantly written down assets, they are now insolvent. And I think that 
that we are probably just in the early innings to borrow a term from baseball, which you know I love, of the pain that's coming to regional banks, especially who have commercial loans on the books. So, yeah. you know, I think that it could be, you know, kind of the 2008 great financial crisis of the commercial real estate world. It's already starting to be, okay? Um, the question is how bad does the Fed and the Treasury let it get before they bring in, you know, a rescue, uh, uh, mm. you know, basically the Fed put um, for for banks? You know, I, I think that what we've seen is post 2008, Michael, the Fed is willing to do whatever it takes to save the system. And what we've seen from COVID response to the bank term funding program that, you know, the banks implemented to save the failing banks last March, they overnight will do something to add a soft, a softer landing and prevent kind of this contagion of this fallout. So I think that there's a lot more pain ahead. I think that the the pain will is just beginning, and I think into next year in 2026, this is yeah. going to be a huge problem, putting not only general partners but limited partners of commercial real estate at risk with their equity, um, as well as putting banks at risk. And I think that if the Fed doesn't act, and listen, I am I'm kind of like Danielle DiMartino Booth in that I think the Fed needs to get rid of all the rescue stuff and let the system work the way it's supposed to, but I don't think that they will. And so mm. I think that they will, re you know, my fear has been that this could be as bad as a savings and loan crisis after the after the 1970s, after the yep. great hiking also devalued commercial real estate mm -hmm. significantly. That led, it was that write down in values of commercial real estate and assets as a whole because of rates increasing that caused the, these banks to fail. It was, it, we're repeating that same thing. But I think that the tools that the Fed and Treasury will engineer, I think that they may extend the bank fund term, uh, bank term funding program. Um, they're not going to rescue the syndicators, but they're going to try to um, help the banks maybe extend and pretend and keep it from being as bad as it could be. But I think it could be very, very bad, Michael. And that's not me being a doomer, right? Mm -mm, it's it's no. me understanding as a commercial real estate operator how quickly on paper assets are devalued when interest rates go up and stay there. And if interest rates stay high, um, the, the crisis will be worse. And so when I say we're softening and we're heading toward recession, I'm also lumping together this, this commercial real estate asset devaluation, you know, properties are down 30, 40% easily across the board, especially office. I see a banking crisis being one of those things that the Fed says, okay, we've gotten inflation low enough now, right? Heading toward two, that now we have to shift gears and save the financial system. And they know the only thing that is going to save commercial real estate in these banks is cutting rates. And I think that they're going to, it's going to twist their arm and they're finally going to cut rates in response mm -hmm. to what they know is that risk. So what I think you're saying to kind of go back to the numbers, I think what you're saying is, Michael, today we're, we're about at two meaning it's early, right? It's just getting started. Sure, there's some high profile pain, but it's going, it's going to eight or nine. It's 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 gonna get ugly over the next, I don't know, 18 to 24 months. Uh is that a yes. fair assumption? It is a fair statement. And and a lot of that too, you know, just so that people understand, a lot of that is because the vast majority of loans done in 2021 and 2022 were bridge loans. So they are temporary loans that are only for two to three years, often with one one year extension. And so, you know, if they took the loans in 2021, their two years was up 2023 and they got that one year extension. So it's not so much yeah. extend and pretend as it is. It was built in. And some yeah. of the lenders, rather than taking the asset back, said, sure, we'll give you that one year extension. But right. that's just starting. You know, the, we're at the beginning of that. So we've already seen foreclosures of banks who wouldn't extend or didn't have it, you know, to extend with these values dropping. Um, you know, that is going to, for those that were three-year loans or taken in 2022, 
we're looking at 2024 being the first year that they're in pain. And then 2025, mm -hmm. you're going to see a lot more. So, you know, the real hope for commercial real estate is that rates simply come down. Um, and that's because properties are valued based upon a risk premium that you can get above the risk-free rate of return, which is the U.S. Treasury rate. So as long as U.S. Treasury rates stay high, investors that want to buy these properties are demanding a higher uh, risk yeah. premium above the treasury. It's raising cap rates. And so overnight on paper, you have lost you know 30% of your value. And that's a pretty consistent number. Now, here's yeah. the key though, Michael, just like with the stock market or just like with your housing equity, if you don't have to sell, you don't realize those losses. They're scary. It looks like you've lost millions and millions of dollars. But if you had a loan that was a longer term loan, like a five-year loan, or a 10-year loan, um, then you're not going to be hit by those things because you just hold it. You continue to mm -hmm. operate it well and you wait till rates do fall before you sell and you end up okay. So I don't think that this is like a level eight, the end of commercial real estate, no, but I yeah. think it's a level eight that if the Fed doesn't lower rates, it could be a, a bloodbath of commercial real estate operators going under as well as banks. That's just the reality. And I, I find it kind of comical and, and not really doing much of a service to, you know, the general public, how many people have I've heard say commercial real estate is such a small little amount on the bank's books. Well, yes, for big banks like Chase and Wells Fargo, but not for the majority of regional banks. It's a large piece of their um, lending mm -hmm. book and their assets. And so it can be a substantial risk to the regional banks. And so I think you have a lot more regional banks start to fail and be consolidated by, by being bought out by bigger banks if if they'll do it. Yeah. And one of the things that uh, I think most of the audience will know, but just in case we have some new uh, new viewers you're in this syndication space, right? You're, you've been in it yes. for years. You have a network, you've done deals, you hear yes. about lots of things. So you, you are undoubtedly hearing from people as GPs or probably even LPs. They're in a, there's a lot of pain going on now. That's not bubbled up to the system. Is that fair? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and here's the sad thing is people don't want to talk about it, right? Because they don't yeah. want to spook number one, their investors, right? I have investors. I, I spend a lot of time studying the economy, not just so that I can be, be smart and make predictions about what's going to happen, but because I'm trying to preserve the wealth of my investors and for myself and make wise decisions and saying, what's the worst thing that can happen? And then what's the likelihood that those things happen? And the reality is, you know, interest rates are just one piece of it. So it, it's a big piece of it. It's really what's made things difficult because if you can't refinance your debt and roll it into a new loan. Um, and be qualified for that. You don't have any option but to walk away unless you have millions of dollars to pay down your loan quite substantially. So the interest rate piece is a big piece of it. But also across many Southern states and coastal states, Texas, you know, being one of them, you know, Texas had a lot of pipes freezing, which was unprecedented for lots of areas of Texas who don't insulate pipes because they're not in the north and they don't normally get, you know, freezes that last a long time. That was a huge hit to insurance companies. Well, so is flooding and hurricanes and, you know, many, many insurance companies are leaving the market. I'll give you one example, Michael, just to, to underscore how big of a deal this could be for those that think it's not. Not only do you have your cap rates rising, cutting off, you know, a significant piece of your value, let's say 30%, but insurance costs, I can tell you, I have properties in Houston. When we bought them a few years ago, we paid $300 per unit per door, $300 per unit per door per year. This year, $1,500 per unit per door per year. I don't care how good you are, how smart you are, how long you've been doing it. Nobody is underwriting that their insurance goes from 300 a door to 1500 a door, right? That's five times the amount. And you can't make up for that in rents, especially in markets that had a lot of building and oversupplied. You can't just raise your rents enough to even cover insurance. Add yeah. to that tax increases that have gone up because values went up. So just taxes and insurance going up alone, you can't keep up with your rents to make up for that difference. Then you add eviction moratoriums, you add you know, the rates going up. 
And, and commercial real estate has been hit with this really triple whammy, especially if you're in the southeastern states that have been so popular because of things like GDP and population growth. Um, it's really painful. And I know many operators struggling. And, you know, I'll be completely um open and honest, as I always try to be, we have a, a two properties that we are not paying out distributions right now to passive investors. And I never thought that we would have to do that. But the reason is, is because we need to hold reserves. We need to be able to cover those expenses that are, you know, nobody could have anticipated, um, no matter how, you know, good and smart you are. And you need to make sure that you can pay, you know, rate caps if you have them and you can pay down that mortgage if it comes due to be refinanced. And and save the assets so that you can sell it when rates fall, yeah. values go back up and preserve your investment and hopefully realize the return on the back end, even though you're not paying out much cash. And so it's just the painful reality that many operators are in. And I'm in a really good position because we didn't do bridge debt, but even not doing bridge debt. Um, we still have a lot of pain in this last couple of years that was not anticipated, not because operators don't know what they're doing, but because of these kind of factors that are really outside of our control. So all that to say, Michael, there's a lot of pain. I know many operators who unfortunately are going into foreclosure. I know investors who reach out to me and say, Anna, I have capital calls, right, from all these deals we're having to pay in money to cover expenses and to help get a refinance done. Should we do it? Should we not? Um, really good operators have a lot of reserves and are paying in millions of their own dollars to try to keep their properties afloat and do right by the investor. But it's it's not easy. It's a very, very challenging market for commercial real estate, and that will trickle into the lender's for those properties that there's just not enough you can do to mm -hmm. raise rents and get those values up to be able to refinance them. Well, let's go into uh bailout because uh, you know, after Silicon Valley bank, uh, when it was really realized that the 10 year treasury value fell because Silicon Valley bank over indexed the bank term sure. funding program came, that was clearly a bailout. It wasn't called one, but it clearly was a bailout. Absolutely. That's expiring. I think it expires March 12th. I think March something, early March. They and, say they won't extend it, but I think they will. Yeah, I mean, so I, not to split hairs. Well, they'll come I, out with 2.0. <laughs> yeah, they'll call it something else. That's yeah. that's how they're going to get around it. Bank term funding right. program stopped. We created blah, 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 blah. It's different. Right. No, it's not different. Just stop lying. But anyways, I want to go back to kind of your point. The banking crisis, re definitely at the regional banking, uh, currently a two, headed to an eight or a nine over the next 24 months. Uh, clearly going to have some regional banks balance sheets turn insolvent if they're forced to mark to market in mask, if they're if they're over indexed on an asset type or an area. That's those are the people that will be hurt the most. Right. Uh so I've been I've been playing with this idea of bailout 2.0, what that might look like. And I think your comment earlier is exactly where I came down. They're going to do whatever they can to protect the lender, but they're going to say F you to the equity. There's no saving the equity is, is how I think this happens. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, the big players are, are saved because the big players are who the Fed needs to inject liquidity into the markets to revamp any kind of faltering economy. And so that's the bottom line. Who sits on the FOMC? Who is it that makes these decisions on interest rates? It's people that run banks, right? They either currently run banks or they used to run banks or they're promised that once they're done, they're going to run banks. Run a so bank, yeah. You have to understand that the Fed is made up, generally speaking, of, you know, high high level bankers, um, you know, some are economists, some are attorneys, but they're kind of all in the system because the reality is that capitalism requires a few things, easy fiscal policy, easy monetary policy, fiscal being the laws, you know, what, what comes out of Congress, monetary being from the Fed, and they need the banks to be the ones that, that either put money in or take money out of the system that make it easier for small businesses and real estate investors to borrow money, to pump up an economy that's stalling, to increase production, to get things going again, and to lend, lend, lend in hopes that that leads to more production increases and higher GDP. 
So if they start to let a whole bunch of banks fail that are the ones who really give lo most loans to small real estate investors, to commercial real estate investors, and to small businesses, then they're going to have a hard time drumming back up the economy once it starts to falter. So if you look at it from that perspective, rather than the cynical, and I understand the cynicism, right? Um, we don't like everything to be bailed out all the time. It just creates wealth gaps that make the richer richer and the poorer poorer, and it continues to happen. But our whole system is built upon this kind of three-legged stool, Michael, where the Fed cannot afford to let the banking system fail. Number one, it will breed distrust in the banking system, but it'll you know, lead to more distrust and anger and polarization toward the politicians. Um, and, you know, in turn, you know, the threats of, you know, going after the 1%, the bank executives, all the, you know, throwing out all the politicians, it really breeds national distrust at a level that they don't want. And so I don't see them ever saying we're going to let banks fail like they did in the savings and loan crisis. I think it, it the economy is too dependent on them. And I think what you will see is consolidation. More and more small and regional banks start to fail. They may let them fail, but they're going to bring in a program, negotiate, you know, maybe it's the BT, you know, FP for a while, and then they negotiate, hey, Chase, Wells Fargo, you guys come in here. And if you buy these banks, we won't, you know, hold you liable or responsible for bad debts and things that run off. Um, I, I think they're always going to try to save the system, but they don't care whether you and I lose a property. They're going to say, well, they took advantage of the low rates we gave them and they should have seen this coming and we're just going to let them let them lose. And then when they cut rates, Michael, when they cut rates, values go back up and the banks sell the properties for a profit. And so, mm. you know, the syndicators, the investors lose, the banks and, and the Fed win. And that's just how it is. Yeah, I think one of the things, if you go back and look at the great financial crisis that really got me was the people that per perpetuated the problem, the big banks with all these, you know, different lending and packaging, they ultimately came out, generally speaking, unscathed and made money. Right. That's why really, I think, yes. yeah, that's why I think this time they protect the banks to your point, but they won't let equity profit. Right. They're not going to let right, the stock should have gone to zero. It should have been right. wiped out. But nope, they're still in existence and they're up a thousand percent or whatever. So I think that was yeah. a huge lesson. And the other thing you take that I take from the uh, SNL crisis, because you and I've talked about it for over a year. Right. They had that resolution trust RTC, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And I could very easily see them that that being the bailout. So at, at a high level, it's OK, we have these assets. Um, and we're going to send it through some kind of foreclosure or deed in lieu or cash or whatever it is. It's going to take that, it's going to make equity go to zero. We're going to take it. And then again, Wells Fargo or B of A or whoever has the debt, they can't hold it because that's not what they're doing, but they'll just transition it to this other government entity, RTC like they're going to hold it for a couple of years, let rates come in, bingo, bango. They make some money and you know, we just we we punish the equity and we protected the banks. It's, it's kind of how I see the chessboard. Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, there, there are complexities in this that make me say, what kind of program are they going to come out with? And I'm not sure. You know, one of the things that that I'm really starting to pay attention to is the Basel three rules that are about to that are supposed to yeah. roll out. And yeah. that is requiring and I think it's an extra 20 percent. I may have it might just be a total of 20 percent, but an increase a, in reserves. Yeah, it's an increase. It's a significant increase in reserves. I've seen I think it's an increase numbers. of 20 percent in bank reserves yeah. that they have to hold back, which yeah. means that banks are going to lend less because they have lend to less. hold more reserves. And so, you know, when you think about, OK, banks are starting to fail. They've got assets that they're having to write down. Now they're having to hold more reserves when they're already tightening lending because of needing to increase reserves just for what they think they might lose. And because deposits have 
you know, fled banks and gone into treasuries and money market accounts, for example, um, CDs that they could get at, you know, brokerage firms. And so you've got this, these banks that kind of have this triple whammy of, you know, flight of deposits for higher rates. Once rates come down, that'll, that'll reverse a little bit. Um, they've got assets they may have to wipe out. And because of that, Michael, and again, I'm in the trenches every day looking at, you know, loans for different properties. Banks simply are not lending. They have been pencils down for a year. And if they are lending, it's only quality assets and they might give you 50, 60% LTV. Um, and that's before a recession. That's before pain in the economy. So once you hit a recession, it's usually about six months and then the banks really tighten. But if Basel III comes into effect, you're going to have these small regional banks. What do they make the most money on? Loans. But they're not going to be able to lend as much. So their profits are going to come down. So not only is it going to hurt liquidity for commercial real estate for a while, which even if rates come down, Michael, if you can't get the money easily and get a high LTV loan, you're not going to make as much profit on deals. And that's going to suppress prices a bit for commercial real estate longer than it really should because of credit tightening. Then you add Basel III, more credit tightening, and it could be a while before asset prices come back up. Um, it's not that magic, you know, rates just have to come back and that'll fix it. It'll fix a lot of it, but it's not going to fix all of it unless the Fed comes up with a way to incentivize banks that despite Basel III, or they delay ba Basel III, but let's say they implement it, that despite Basel III, we're going to come up with some new program, a federally backed, you know, mortgage for commercial real estate, like we already have with multifamily, by the way, but you don't have with storage and office and things like that to incentivize banks to lend, to kind of revamp the commercial real estate world and to try to prop those asset values back up so that eventually they can be sold for a profit. So there's so many little pieces of this that make it hard to say, what's the Fed going to do? But I will say I would bet money um, that they will do something. They will bail out the banks and kick the can down the road until values come back up before they make them be written off or, you know, sell them, you know, for a profit. Yeah. A lot of people don't remember that. Uh, I think it was $780 billion TARP program actually was a profitable program. Uh, yes. So this could be something like that and and actually yeah. be profit for the, is all you got to do is hold. And that's why you have a big balance sheet. Well, right. let's go back to a question I was asked on a podcast. I want to make sure we got to this. So yesterday I was interviewed on a podcast and the guest or the host asked me, what is my greatest fear about the housing or real estate market? And I have never been asked that question. I took 20 or 30 seconds to really think about my answer. So Anna, I want to ask you, what is your greatest fear about housing and or real estate market? You know, I, I, my answer is different for me as an investor than it is for me as a human being. Okay, if I can say that. Sure. Um, I, my biggest fear as a parent and, you know, somebody who cares about lots of young people coming up these days is that housing will remain so unaffordable that we really, really become a renter nation um, without the option to have the ability to kind of set your roots, have a family home, rely on it to appreciate over time. Because I think that Although I, again, am bearish on where I think the economy is heading in the short term and rates are in the short term, I think long term, uh, we have much higher rates than we have had. And maybe where they are today is kind of where they stay um, because of factors that I think secularly long term are inflationary and because mm -hmm. of the national debt and the fact that if the Treasury wants to pay it off, they're going to have to do three things cut programs and expenses, maybe even like first-time homebuyer programs, right? Raise taxes significantly. They're going to have to do it. They just won't say so till after the election. Deflate away money through inflation. And they've got to sell securities. And they've got to sell securities in an environment where people are doubtful that the U.S. can continue on this path of higher debt. And that means higher interest rates. So when I look at those things together, I see a period of higher interest rates um, and constrained supply for a long time for all these people with low two, three, four percent interest rate loans. That's going to make it really unaffordable over the next several years, maybe a decade 
for people like my children to buy a home, not be, you know, so budget constrained by the price of their home. And I think that that's bad for the economy. Um, so, so that would be kind of my worst case is continual, continual long-term unaffordability for 80% of the population just to own a home. That's, that's amazing. That was essentially my answer word for word. You know, wow. I, I've been, yeah, I've been watching a for a housing ownership. I think today it's at 64%. For the last 50 years, right? I have a spreadsheet that goes back. We've been between 63 and like 68. It's It's been not very variable, right? Sure. And, and I said is, I fear a day where home ownership falls below 50%. It's, it's, mm -hmm. That would that in my opinion, that would crush the American dream. It would it would take something that I deem as one of our strengths as a country and and make it not important. And again, I've I've done work in Europe. There are European countries where home ownership's below 40%. It's wow. just accepted. Right. And I don't want that. I don't that's my greatest fear is we really become renter nation. Uh, because right. of affordability. So it was, right. it's and again, you know, as a real estate investor, this is why I said, you know, as a as a person, I still have morals and I still care about, you know, other people. I, yes, I want to make profits anywhere that I can, that I can do it honestly and ethically. Um, if we become more and more of a renter nation, I want to own more properties that can I can rent out to people that are nice, like single family homes. You know, yeah. again, I'm mostly a multifamily investor, but I still have single family homes. I have townhouses. I have fourplexes. You know, I want to be able to provide affordable housing, or even if they rent forever, they rent a really nice home that they mm -hmm. can feel like it's their home, right? So it, every time there's a challenge, there's ways for us to come in and truly and be the hero and help people um, and still make decent money doing it. So, you know, it, I, it, it makes me more bullish on being a rental property owner because there's going to be more and more need to provide rental housing than there is necessarily you know, building new homes for people that may or may not be able to afford them. Yeah. I, you know, I'm completely okay with a flat decade of flat rents, flat home price. We, we this, this has to get better uh, or it'll be a slippery slope and, and, and we really could get there. So we're going to yeah. close on a topic about something that I call financial engineering. Earlier in the conversation, you talked about pain coming to good operators, people who did the right things. You talked about pain in a couple of your deals, for example, I unfortunately think that there's been a lot of financial engineers, newbies, who came in and saw easy money. And these are the operators, like that example in Houston, who overpaid by millions of dollars, yes. had uh, bridge debt, one year, two year bridge debt, no interest rate, um, you know, lock or whatever that's called. Right. And the level of finance, it is going to be, it, it, there's going to be lots of lawsuits, lots of stuff going on in this space. Not because of the people, nobody with like a 10 year track record, hopefully is doing this stupid stuff. But if you had a 10 month track record and you paid some guru to teach you, you are going to get, you are done. You're in trouble. Your LPs are in trouble. And I, the problem, the last thing I'll say is I actually think when the pain is counted, Multifamily is going to dwarf office, right? Look at the LT LTVs, look at the volume, look at the cash out refis, look at all this stuff that happened the last couple of years. I think multifamily is going to dwarf office. And I don't think a lot of people understand that. Yeah, you know, I, I think that it's going to be, again, I think there's going to be pockets and areas of the country where that's probably right. You know, I'll, I'll use this as an example, and this is no knock on, this person particularly, because I don't know him personally. Okay. But I'll just say, for example, Brad Sumrock. So Brad Sumrock had a big coaching program for multifamily in Dallas. And most of his students, because I do know of quite a few of them, um, they went on bus tours and they bought a bunch of properties in Dallas, Fort Worth area. So it was very heavily concentrated that you have a lot of new syndicators joining forces and buying properties in that particular market. And again, I invest there. Um, I'm developing on the path of progress outside of Dallas. Um, and so I understand how 
many times properties have traded. And for example, there are properties that we've looked at, Michael, that were distressed because we're only really looking at distressed assets at this point um, that have traded three times in five years, right? More yeah. and more yeah. and more. Yeah. So they yeah. they go in, you know, they, and, and the problem, the, the issue with any kind of market that's rising, especially near as you near the peak, is that if rates are low and and the you're nearing the peak, it is easy to see on paper how you can make more money. Rents are going up post pandemic. All those things that you look for looked good and they were getting better and better and better. And so um, you had a lot of trading and a lot of concentration of multifamily buying by lots of new investors that were churning properties. And so in the Sun Belt in Texas, for example, um, you have a lot of syndications comparatively to the yeah. amount of what used to be all institutional, you know, apartment owners like REITs. So, mm -hmm. but there's other areas of the country that they're still owned far more by REITs and big funds than they are in individuals. So again, I think, I think you're going to see pockets where multifamily definitely has more pain though. The, the silver lining where I don't think it's actually going to be as bad as commercial is one Two things. Fundamentally, people need a place to live. So True. once you've absorbed the new construction for multifamily, and there will always be absorption if jobs continue to come, which is why I still like Dallas, despite being, you know, oversupplied in class A stuff. Okay. So you have a lot of new class A apartment buildings where they're the ones with the highest rents. So they're going to be the ones that are the hardest to fill competing with other new complexes. But the average Joe who wants to live in an, a middle-class apartment complex, a class C plus B product, there's not a whole lot of supply of that type of property that's mm -hmm. currently been being renovated because people can't afford to buy them and renovate them and do the big value add like they did before. But the other piece of that Michael, is that multifamily had the blessing, if you did it, of getting federally backed mortgages, yep. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. I've sure. only done Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac deals. I didn't do bridge debt. So if you look at the percentage of multifamily properties that are that have loans by Fannie and Freddie, they are longer loans. They're generally oh, yeah. a 10-year loan with a five-year rate. So those are not going to be as distressed nearly as those bridge debt properties, often, you know, many of which were done by, by newer syndicators who didn't have a ton of experience. Um, so I, I still think office is worse um, in, in big city where companies are not going back to work. But there is a lot of pain in multifamily. And unfortunately, a lot of it is newer syndicators that, again, you can you can look back in hindsight. So I'll, I want to push back just a little bit, right? Sure. I know some of these operators. I've spoke on stages and had operators come out and say, I want to do what you do. And I want to be able to be on a stage. And I'm like, bigger isn't always better. <laughs> Slow and steady wins a race, right? Um, who did thousands and thousands of units partnering with other people, um, over the last couple of years and that are that are losing properties, right? And I don't I don't look at them and say, shame on you, you should have known. Now, they should have known. They should have had better advisors telling them these are the kind of things that happen at the end of cycles and you need to be careful. But the reality is the Fed says we're not raising rates. Yeah. The multifamily brokers all said, Fed's not raising rates. Cap rates have always stayed low. They'll never go back up again. Your lenders, your big lenders are saying, this isn't risky. This inflation is transitory. So all the people that were telling them mm -hmm. that they found a good deal and that the numbers were going to keep getting better, they believed them. They believed those advisors. And all this is the part where I, I say, I wish they hadn't have done it. I wish they had been slower. People are going to get hurt, both GPs and LPs, who didn't understand how bad things could get, right? Um, and a lot of things that were unforeseen, but some things that were foreseen. The thing about financial engineering, though, Michael, is if we're real with ourselves, all of us make money through financial engineering. We say, okay, there's an asset. 
How can I make it worth more? How can I lower my expenses? How can I get the best debt on the property to make me profit the most? We're all in the business as investors to find areas where we think we can we, we can create value through financial engineering. And so whether you're a single family home flipper or you buy a single family you know, house and you convert from, you know, I'm in the Northeast. So let's say you convert from, you know, gas to, from, from oil to gas or from baseboard heating to, you know, electric heat pumps. So your tenants are taking over, you know, your heat expenses. We're all finding ways to increase income, lower expenses, get the best debt and create value and, and equity and cash flow. So I don't see a lot of the syndicators as being nefarious or doing something purposely wrong. They were living in an, an economy of capitalism with free money, cheap money that has lasted for years and years that they never thought would stop. And that has huge consequences. And one of the reasons that you know, people will come to me and say, Anna, why, why do I have to be accredited to invest in your deals? Well, mm -hmm. one of the reasons that we require accredited investors and the SEC um, understands this is that they say, and our, our offering documents, Michael, say, you can lose all of this. Things in the economy can happen that I could not foresee. Um, natural disasters could happen that I could not foresee. Our property managers, our operators, they could die. Someone could embezzle money. If you invest in this, you understand you could lose all of it and you can afford to lose it. And so I think there will be a lot of people trying to sue or bring complaints to the SEC. But if they're accredited investors, it, it's their job to read the PPM, to understand the financials, and to realize that they're taking risks that may or may not be within the operator's understanding or experience level or outside of their control and the SEC, unless the operators committed fraud, and, and there is some of that. So mm -hmm. I'm not trying to give them a, you know, a free pass, but unless they committed fraud, being less competent, um, you know, than they should have been or having less foresight than they maybe should have been, um, you know, making mistakes, but largely outside of their control, the SEC is not going to go after the GP. The LPs are going to be out their money. So if there's a lesson for anybody, and I'm talking to myself included, because I invest in lots of private placements that I don't operate because I want passive income, is you have to, when you're investing in anything, whether it be a syndication for apartments or whether it be you know, a new self storage fund, or you know, a big company that's that's coming out with AI, and they're going to need to be the next best thing. Never put all your eggs in one basket. Know that anything you invest, you've got to be willing to be able to lose it. And too many people, passive investors, went all in, invested a ton of money with new operators that they knew were brand new. And unfortunately, you know, there's consequences of that for them as well. So I, I truly feel bad for everybody. Um, but this is kind of what happens when there's financial engineering, not just individually as investors, but at the Fed. And the reality is the Fed moves markets in a way that can have huge impacts on values and our success as um, operators if we are dependent on interest rates staying the same forever. Anna, you're amazing. This is such a great conversation. The audience loves our long form. Where can they find you? Great. You can find me here almost every week on your show. You can find me for coaching, consulting, and deal review advice at AnnaKellyInvesting.com. Thank you so much.